Lord, as we come into your presence, we we bless Bill, and we also bless Roland and Heidi over in the other uh, overflow room, and we bless them too. And we pray, Holy Spirit, you'd come. Whoa, you would come. God, we want you to have your, your just full right away here in Jesus' name. Just take the right away. God, you know, Lord, you drive down the middle if you want. Just whatever you want to do, we bless you and we praise you. And we ask for, for the wisdom and the revelation of this man and the teaching that you've given him to call us into the deeper things. And, the, and, and we pray for Father, just for, for Roland and Heidi, you'd anoint them and bless them too. And, and we pray, God, that, they, that not only would you uh, let us receive the revelation of what he's talking about, but we could eat of the fruit of that revelation in this meeting tonight. Heaven invade earth tonight. And we, we, we thank you, God, for a, um, a brother, a, a man we love. Uh, and we thank you, God, for his sacrifice that he's in the Spirit seeking you, praising you in every situation of life and didn't stop pressing in. Thank you, God, that he did not let go of that passion to see more. We thank you, Lord, for the fruit that now we get to gain from him and we honor him as an, a, a, one of your men of God, one of the ones that you've given a special grace to. In Jesus' name, we want to receive an apostolic reward tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening. It's not a good way to start. One of our elders says, the only reason we bring a watch to church is to see if the date changed. <laughs> huh? Can you have what? Oh. Uh, which, which one do you want? You especially want that one. It's preferred by everyone under five. <laughs> um, she's either desperate for God or has very smart mom and dad who knows my personal weakness. Oh, I had an experience years ago. I don't know how much I've shared this one. It's not been very often. I... I, I just, uh, my daughter was like eight or nine, ten years old, and we were at a family reunion. 165 people from around the world came. My, in this, my mom's side of the family, there was, they were connected to 48 different pastors and missionaries from around the world. That's just my mom's side of the family. So it was, it was the weirdest family reunion you ever went to. It was, it was like a conference. But really, we had, I'm serious. We had, we had meetings. We had, we had panel discussions. We had people speak on given subjects. We had a theme song written out of Zephaniah chapter 3 for this gathering. I mean, it was just weird. And there's a part of my family that just, that just has this thing about square dancing. Now, when I was in school, I mean, we just didn't dance, period. And I would just use the excuse that our church didn't believe in it to get out of square dancing in school for PE. I just didn't want anything to do. It looked stupid to me. And I, you know, forgive me if that's what you enjoy, but it just, it was just, I could stand on the side and laugh at everybody trying to remember what to do next. And I, I kind of enjoyed that, but that was about it. Well, they had this, this, they decided to do it at the family reunion. And my wife looked at me and said, no, don't even think of it. I'm, I, uh, that is off limits. I don't dance. I just don't. I'll jump before God. That's it. He's the only one that can get me to dance. So we went, and uh, we were watching everybody doing their stuff. And my daughter came up to me. And she stood in front of me, and she said, Daddy, would you dance with me? I 
I lost the ability to say no. I was like, huh? It was not fair. It was not fair at all. She completely undermined my resolve. I, my family will tell you, when I decide something, I decide something. Nobody, no one can talk me out of it, uh, except for one person I found. She was eight years old. <laughs> Daddy, would you dance with me? I got out there and looked stupid, and she had a smile on her face for hours, so it was worth it. So, anyway, all right. Some stuff in the back. i got to do this fast because we don't have a whole bunch of time. Uh, there's a study guide. Actually, we revised the study guide. If you got the previous revised to When Heaven Invades Earth, uh, pretty good uh, thing to go through. Uh, the Advancing Kingdom. Uh, a lot of folks don't know this, but the normal Christian life is one of victory. <laughs> You just might enjoy that as a concept. <laughs> Erasing the line between secular and sacred. This one's called revolution. Uh, once you're born again, there's no such thing as secular occupation. The Lord in the scripture takes the swords, or excuse me, the plowshares, and he turns them into swords. He takes natural occupations and he makes them supernaturally effective. Revival outside the camp. Be, wearing, be willing to bear stigma to carry revival to the nations. And this one's called the coming Pentecost. The rain that's coming is stewarded. How do we put this? Psalms 84 says, if you turn the valley of weeping into a spring, you take what you've been given and turn it into a refreshing moment you will attract the clouds of the outpouring. Many people are waiting for rain, but they haven't stewarded their moment. And water attracts water. You take your valley of weeping, turn it into a spring of refreshing, water attracts water. You will draw the rain of the outpouring. All right? Or help me out. And give that stuff away. Super. All right. <laughs> Over here. <laughs> that pitiful cry almost got you something. Girl. That was good. <laughs> I, I'm going to start needing to send a bodyguard with her when I send her out to give stuff away. I can see. All right, you guys ready? Uh, let's turn to John 5, and uh, we'll see if we actually can start there in a few minutes. So just turn there. I'm, I'm not going to talk long for me. It's not going to be long because the hour's already late. And I want to get to where we can pray for people. So well, this will be a devotional for me, a regular sermon for the rest of you. Most closed heavens for the believer is between the ears. <laughs> what verse was that? I made it up. <laughs> Most closed heavens for the believers between the years. The misconception that you could live under darkness when the Father is jealous for the spirit that dwells in you. That misconception has created a generation of shadow boxers who are always at war but never coming into victory because there's no enemy that they're fighting because the problem is between the years. There's spiritual fatigue that enters in when you're constantly at battle and you don't have an enemy that's anywhere close. The enemy is the, is the deception in your own heart and mind. See, the Father is jealous for the spirit that dwells within us. How much darkness does it take to put out a light? It's not possible, is it? How much light does it take to put out darkness? Not much. When we live with misconceptions that we fuel 
with spiritual disciplines and activities. We make unintentional agreements with the enemy and never realize and discover the potential of the moment that we're living in because we are always trying to arrive and not realize what we've already obtained. Many people are bored in their prayer lives because they continue to pray for things that they already possess. It's very discouraging to continue to pray and not see a breakthrough when the real problem is I just haven't realized my breakthrough. The Lord doesn't mind us starting in prayer with complaining, groaning, moaning, any of that stuff. He seems to be just fine with it. He's not intimidated or nervous by it. But it's a bad deal when we end up the way we start. In fact, it could be said that if I end where I start, I didn't pray. I was just complaining. Prayer is supposed to be a time where I engage with God, where I pick up His heart and I lead, learn to see from His perspective. The real purpose of prayer is not merely to get an answer, it's to become an answer. We engage with God to be transformed in our perspective because we're co-laborers with the Lord that have been given position in life to enforce His will. We enforce not through strong arm, we enforce through decree. We enforce by realizing that we actually carry the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, into society. And the measure of a presence that you and I are able to carry is always according to what we are willing to jealously guard. Because he's given his spirit without measure. There's no limit or restriction. We have the fascinating stories of history with the Charles Finney who merely rode on a train through a town because of the glory that was upon him. As he rode through the town, the town broke into revival. Those are stories that are there prophetically to stir us to imagine greater potential than what we've ever experienced before. God does not give us insight about what is possible, so we'll strategize. He gives us insight about what is possible to make us desperate. Desperation causes us to be reformed, reprogrammed, reshaped. We cry so much, not so much out of discipline, but out of absolute desperation. And the Lord's trying to engage us on His level of passion. Christianity was never meant to be known by its discipline. Discipline makes a good backstop to catch straight pitches. Christianity is supposed to be known by its passion, its fire. The one king who hit the ground three times, the prophet became, he hit the arrows on the ground three times, the prophet became angry with him. He said, if you only would have struck the ground five or six times, you would have had complete victory over the enemy. But now you're only going to have three temporary victories. What's the point? Is leaders without passion cost everyone who follows the victory they could have had. All of Israel suffered defeat because the guy at the top had no passion for the moment he lived in. Passion causes people to burn in unreasonable ways. <clears throat> you can't have passion and the respect of men. <clears throat> you have to decide which one you want. plan to. <laughs> Still going. If you're cautious, everyone around you will cause you call you wise. Because the fear of man masquerades as wisdom. <clears throat> You'll just not move many mountains. So the Lord calls us into lifestyles where we engage with Him. And that engagement, it's called prayer, is to obtain divine perspective. Divine perspective is just merely your inheritance. It's not supposed to be 
a momentary glimpse of a problem I have so that I feel better that I know God has a solution. It includes that, but it's actually an experience where I get to participate in what is already my inheritance, which is being seated in heavenly places with Christ. Unfortunately, that great truth has been reduced to a doctrine. We take the life out of truth by reducing it to a doctrine or moving it out of the experience realm. The doctrine is good, but all doctrine are invitations for encounters. Revelation knowledge that doesn't lead me to an encounter just makes me more religious. So we've been invited on this journey where God takes us into a dangerous realm. The dangerous realm is called revelation knowledge. Paul warned us. He said knowledge puffs up, so you're going into somewhere that's really dangerous. When he said knowledge puffs up, he, wasn't, he didn't say carnal knowledge, knowledge about evil things. He said knowledge. Knowledge in the context of teachers, those who unveil truth. And yet God invites us saying, listen, without revelation knowledge, my people perish. So we thrive with revelation, we perish without. There's no middle ground. It's like, it's like we either thrive or we diminish. We are so absolutely dependent on fresh understanding from God. It's very tempting for us to live from what God has said instead of what he's saying. There's such a concern about contradiction that we sacrifice oftentimes a willingness to be a hearer of God's voice. But when the Bible says that we live by every word that proceeds out of his mouth, he's not talking about every word that once proceeded. It's the ongoing interaction with God. This book was written with the assumption you would have a living, ongoing relationship with him and that it was he alone that could interpret this book. Because there are some times where he will talk to you on one angle and a year later talk to you in a, almost a contradictory fashion. And if we build doctrine, we build monuments around specific doctrines and don't keep it wineskins that flex with the move of the Spirit, then we become our own biggest enemy by creating systems that defy the very movement of the Spirit of God we say we're hungry for. And the Lord is working to bring us into encounters. And these encounters are sometimes very simple. Sometimes you're just some of you, even tonight during worship or during the time where um, Randy was reading that uh, great piece about John. And just these waves of peace and presence just come and they settle on us. And, and these, these moments are so amazing because they redefine who we are. We, we don't get up and say, wow, I received 12 volumes of Revelation tonight. But what we do is we get impacted. How many of you have been in a situation where you were clueless as to what to say to a person, but you found yourself speaking things you didn't know you knew? Aren't those moments wonderful? You ever stand there and wish, like, could somebody please turn on the tape recorder? I, I need to listen to this again because this is good. This could, my mama won't believe what I just said. She'll, she'd be really impressed if I could get her this tape. Right? You had that happen? I always thought that was the Holy Spirit speaking to me in that moment what to say. And I'm sure that happens, but I'm actually more convinced right now that most of the time that's not what's happening. What he's doing is because I put myself in over my head, he is drawing out of the deep of me what he's been depositing in me in those times of divine encounter. He's merely bringing to the surface what is already here. How many of you found yourself saying things that you, you never had language for before and you said it and it made sense and you knew you believed it all along but you never once heard yourself say it in your whole life? That's what I'm talking about. See, he draws these things to the surface and you begin to speak with an understanding that your spirit man has. And now your mind becomes the student. Does that make sense? 
So the Lord brings these things to the surface because as we speak or as we're in that environment, we start throwing out things that we never realized we really knew. And suddenly my, my mind is engaging, saying, all right, I'm now the student. And I'm to learn to see and to perceive and to pick up on what the Spirit of God has been teaching to the spirit of man. Okay, too much? You all right? The process of learning is, is the connection between the Holy Spirit and your spirit and the soul of man. The person who only does what he understands is a carnal Christian. Because that means we reduce God to a package that is comprehensible by us. Many people unknowingly are actually looking for a God who is made in their image. The unwillingness to live with mystery. Mystery is one of the most essential ingredients to Christianity. It's why it's called the faith. By nature, we are committing ourselves to follow when we don't understand because we are more, we are more confident in the person than we in, am in our understanding. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. The confidence is in his ability. I, I, I grew out of a, uh, came out of a season where I had more confidence in my ability to blow it than I did in his ability to keep me. I don't mean blow it morally. I mean just, you know, I just tried to honor God and it just didn't work and I'd lay hands on this person. No one was healed and it seemed that more demons came into that guy when I tried to deliver him and... I'm just things just didn't seem to work out like I thought they should, you know. And then uh, I started to see that he's more than enough. He's just he's just more than enough. He's so much more than enough. I can I can trust. I can actually exert a faith in my ability to fall short, or I can exert a faith and his ability to make up for any shortness I have. And that approach to life is just so much better. So I want to encourage you that. John 5, are you still there? Let's just take a few verses, talk about these for a little bit, and, uh, and then we're going to pray for the sick. All right? John 5, are you still there? Did you quit and put your Bible away? Verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John's. It's referring to John the Baptist. Previous verse, he was the burning and shining light lamp. Verse 36, I have a greater witness than John's for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. This is a fascinating concept. It's, it's um, now let me read kind of a tandem passage of John 10. I'll just read it to you. He says, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. I just want to emphasize for a moment, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, I guess, in a conference like this, but the mandate for miracles is so vital that Jesus said in John 10, he says, if I don't do them, don't believe me. Now that's a fascinating statement. Remember, the standard that he was setting for himself was the standard he had passed on to us when he, we were commissioned. He said, if I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me. Now, what was he saying here? We've got the Old Testament prophets that have all spoken of his coming. We have nature itself that have testified of his coming. We have the stars, the stargazers followed. We have demons of hell crying out of people, pointing to him, saying that he's the Christ. We have so many realms that are testifying. Angels show up to the shepherds and declare that he is the Christ. We have this ongoing revelation all pointing to who he is. And yet Jesus stands and he says, all these testimonies of who I am, you don't have to believe one of them. You're all off the hook, off of all of it, if I don't do the miracles. The miracles are not a side note. Those who say, if we have to choose between power and character, we'll choose character. That's not a legal choice. Jesus did not make the separation, and it's illegal for even for us even to bring that up in, in 
in the conversation because there is no option. If you have good character, which I pray everybody in this room does, you will impress people around you and they will applaud your character, but very few will be converted because of your character. You feed the poor, they'll say it's about time. The church should have been feeding the poor all along. You do these various things, uh, sacrificial living and all this stuff, uh, integrity in business, they go, that's awesome, I want to work with you. I, I want to work with people that are honest. Forgive me if this sounds a little harsh, but I, I believe this in the core of my being, that as important as righteousness and integrity is, it forces very few people to a decision. Power, on the other hand, forces people to decide. You and I are obligated to live with power. Powerlessness is inexcusable. When you take the spirit of the resurrected Christ, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead, and you cause him to take up residence in individuals, it is required that we learn how to demonstrate power. The one time the disciples couldn't get a breakthrough, they asked Jesus privately, how come this one didn't work? And Jesus said, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. In other words, this one you have to fight privately before you come public. But strangely, Jesus neither, neither prayed nor fasted in that moment. Because his perspective on prayer and fasting was not merely to get a breakthrough in a specific case. I want to challenge you on this one. Many times we wait till somebody's dying and then we call a fast and we pray. There's, that's not a problem. I'm just saying we wait until there is a momentum of evil and then we cry out and pray and fast. Jesus neither prayed nor fasted in that crisis. What does it tell us? He had already prayed and fasted, not for a case, but he prayed and fasted for a lifestyle. He broke into realms in God that are available to every person, that are sustainable manifestations of God's life through an individual, not merely dependent on a crisis coming up, but a lifestyle that enables us to draw from that which we have obtained in our encounter with the Lord. I think I said it this morning. I'll say it again. Most everything you need in life will be brought to you, but most of what you want you'll have to go get. There's something about penetrating, piercing into the realms in God by faith, taking hold of what God has said is available by promise. Learning how to apprehend these realms in God. There's one particular ministry I know of where they have 100% success on three diseases. Last I heard it was probably 10 by now. but Three diseases, 100% of the time when they pray for them, those people are healed. Heidi has battled and come into a realm of anointing in the area of deafness in the villages of Africa with 100% success. She calls for all the deaf to be brought and all the deaf are healed 100% of the time. Why? It's a realm in God. When I hear of one person that has obtained a realm like that, it makes me jealous. Jealous not in an ungodly sense, but provoked in the sense, if that's available for them, then it's available for me because God's no respecter of persons. They merely responded to a possibility, to a potential. They merely responded to a reality that exists and is available for everyone. But so few see it. We, we are caught up in distractions. We are caught up in things that pull our affections away. Why does God work so hard to give us uh, an appetite for His heavenly reality? Because He wants the affection of our heart anchored in a world that we cannot see. Because if my heart is anchored in a world I cannot see, I will live to bring that thing into this world. I will live to bring this into a manifestation. These realms in God, some of them have them in business, some have them in family and relationship, but these realms become the possession of individual believers. When the Lord takes you into an experience, He does not take you into an experience as a visitor or a guest. He doesn't take you, for example, as a church, into the realm of joy for three services so you can say, we once had that visitation too. He doesn't take you into the realm of joy as a visitor where you can walk in and say, well, that was amazing. And ten years later, churches are still sitting there waiting for God to bring another wave of refreshing of joy. Why? 
when he took you in, he took you in as an heir. And he gave you keys to re-enter that realm whenever you determine refreshing from joy is needed. See, experience is the beginning of the obtaining or possessing an inheritance. That's why he says, freely you receive, freely give. Anything that you taste of is the beginning of your discovery of what your inheritance is. Okay, does this make any sense? All right. So if you look through our history, one of the great tragedies that we have in church history is that we go into experiences, momentary experiences, maybe for a week of meetings, maybe for six months, maybe sus sustained meetings for six months or a year or whatever. And then we, those, that cycle of meetings end, and we are waiting for God to come and do that again instead of realize when He took us into that realm, He took us in to expose our inheritance. Because then we steward the realm according to need. I don't need, I don't need for Him to come and bring a wave of joy across the room again because He's ready to do that in any given moment. As the pastor of the flock, what I do before a meeting is I walk through and sometimes I sense, oh, we need, to, we need just real refreshing and joy. So this is what I do. I begin to pray privately. Father, we need a breakthrough and joy tonight. We, and we have a pre-service prayer an hour before the meeting. So I'm praying privately. But I won't pray out loud because I, I will actually run a test. I don't want to suggest joy because I don't want people to laugh out of suggestion. Not that that's bad. It's just I don't want it. I'm running an experiment. So I've come into this, this concept, this understanding. I inherited this realm of joy. I now get to steward it. So I have, the only way I know to learn is to experiment. So in prayer, I begin to pray. I say, Lord, we need breakthrough and joy tonight. So this is what I do. I don't say a word. I walk around and I start praying for people in our prayer room. I start laying hands on people. And I won't even pray out loud. I won't say one thing out loud. I won't say, oh, God, release fresh joy. That's not a bad prayer. It's just in this experiment, I want to make sure that what I've discovered in Revelation is truly a revelation from God. So I begin to lay hands on people, and in my heart I'm just saying, Lord, tonight's the night for joy. And every time I discover that realm in prayer that we need refreshing by joy, I walk around, I don't say a word, I just start laying hands on people, joy begins to get stirred up in the room. Why? Because I'm just stewarding a realm that's been given. The same thing happens in realms of healing, deliverance, the prophetic. These are things that we're supposed to learn to steward. This thing gets much bigger than that. These are tiny little, you know, these are, these are almost like strings that are attached to great treasure. These are tiny little things that actually take us to much greater things. Like in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul reads off the list of our inheritance, a representative list, and he says, death is yours, life is yours, the world is yours. Like, what are you going to do with it? you got the planet. And he starts going through this representative list that is absolutely mind-boggling because if the church can discover what we've already been given, we can better steward and invest for worldwide transformation, transformation of families, cities, and nations. To remain ignorant of inheritance is to live below potential. He says, I've got a greater witness than John's. He was the greatest of all Old Testament prophets, prepared his way. He says, I've got a greater witness than his. It's the works that I do. Now you look at the context. Works in the Gospel of John refer specifically to miracles. Let's move on, verse 37. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent you do not believe. Look at verse 38 again. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent you do not believe. That's an amazing statement. Are you guys all right? Okay. You do not have his word abiding in you. How could Jesus tell? Because when I came on the scene, you didn't receive me. What's the point? When the Word is abiding in us, we instinctively respond to the new thing God is doing. Yeah. 
when the word is abiding in the heart of a person, it's different than abiding in the head. Concept abides here. Humility and tenderness, yieldedness, reside here. Faith is not the result of striving. It's the result of surrender. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls in James 1. He says, the word isn't abiding in you. How can I tell? Because you didn't, res- you didn't respond to me favorably when I showed up. In other words, that fresh thing that God is doing. How many of you do not want to miss the next thing God does? All right, here it is. It just tells us how. This group missed it. There's two things that are imperative in a person's life to keep them in a place where they will respond positively to whatever new thing God is doing. Number one is to have the word of what God has said and is saying abiding in your heart, where you just, like Mary did with the word concerning Jesus, she just pondered these things in her heart. You just keep it in your heart, number one. But number two is keeping connected to your personal need for God. The Pharisees lived separate from an awareness of their need. The tax collector, the prostitute, the woman caught in adultery, the stargazers, the man of the Gadarenes, the demon-possessed, the tormented, they all knew who Jesus was when he came. And the one thing that they had going for them is they all lived with an awareness of their need for God. Even though they were delving in great sin, even though they were living in rebellion, they had one reality that was intact. They knew they were in great need. How I many you know the prostitute does what she does, but she has in the back of her mind, boy, I need a way out of this thing. Are you with me? The drug addict has this thing going on, but they cry at night, boy, I wish I could get out of this. I wish I never would have started this. Are you guys alive? In this? All right. So here's these two things, the abiding word, but the second thing is being connected with, not in a depressing or self-introspective uh, way, but being connected with my sense of personal need for God. The Pharisees did not have that awareness. Because they did not have that awareness, they did not have the lenses through which to recognize the Messiah when He came. And everybody in this room, you've been impacted by the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And we've already heard throughout history that it is typical for those who have experienced an outpouring of the Spirit of God to be the ones who persecute those who experience the next outpouring. But we do have some heroes of the faith that didn't succumb to that temptation. Mariah Woodworth Edder is one of them. She was a part of about four different major moves of God, adjusting to the winds of God at every turn in the road. She should be a hero for everyone in this room because she never settled on simply promoting what God did last week. Her heart was to continuously move with whatever God was doing. These two principles are things that you and I can keep tabs on in our own life. Abiding Word of God. What is God saying? The promise, the potential. What does He want to do on the earth before He returns? Keeping that thing intact, number one. But number two, living with the realization, I am so desperately in need of God. I am so desperately in need of more. Does that make sense? All right, let's move on. Verse 39 says, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but it's these that testify of me and you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. This is a verse I actually quote fairly often. You search the Scriptures, for you think in them you have eternal life, and it's these that testify of me. If you could picture this almost like a diving board. People come into the Word, and they think that this is the end. This is a... Chris Valton, uh, my associate, gave a great illustration this last week. He talked about the first time he came to the church, and I, I, uh, he was on staff, and I, I asked him to go to the airport to uh, pick up Bobby Connor, and he had never met Bobby before. So he had, I um, uh, gave him a brochure, a conference brochure, and he had in the seat next to him a picture of Bobby Connor. Now, how many know that's not Bobby in the seat? But it does represent Bobby. It will help him to know when he goes to the airport what guy looks like that picture. This is not God. But it will help you to recognize Him.
You search the scriptures because you think in them is eternal life. The religious spirit wants it to be Father, Son, and Holy Bible. I believe this is the Word of God. I am just, I'm so committed to every thing in this book. I, I love it all. I love the maps and the table of contents. I just like all of it. I like it all. I just got mine rebound to elephant hide. Isn't that awesome? It's just missing the bullet hole. Oh, I'm not in Texas. That doesn't go over well in Pennsylvania and California. Sorry. I just slipped out. You search the Scriptures because you think in them. You think that the searching of Scripture is what's going to give you life. This is the diving board, the launching pad, that which launches you into divine encounter, without which you don't know God. By itself, this is that which kills. With the Spirit of God, this is that which gives life. It's a dangerous life we've been invited to. And it is absolutely imperative that we learn how to continuously fellowship with the Spirit of God because He is the one the only one that leads us consistently into life. All right? Let's keep moving. Verse 41. I do not receive honor from men, I do, uh, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. All right, all right, all right. He's just, just letting them have it. <laughs> I have come in five my Father's name. You do not receive me. If another comes in his name, him you will receive. Here's a verse I want us to look at. Verse 44. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. Interesting verse. How can you believe who receive honor from men? Now, how many understand that Jesus is the one who sets the standard for the lifestyle of honor? Give honor to whom it is due. Children, honor your parents and the Lord for this is right. The whole... The whole directive for a lifestyle, a culture of honor, was born out of the heart of God. He's not dealing with a culture of honor here. He is contrasting seeking the favor of man instead of seeking the favor of God. What's another word for it? Fear of man. Listen to what he's saying. He says, how can you believe who seek honor from one another? Are you getting this? That the fear of man is what undermines faith? The fear of man and faith do not coexist. How can you believe who seek the honor of man and not the honor from God? What is the one requirement for pleasing God? Faith. How can you believe when you seek the honor that comes from man and not that which comes from God. Does this make any sense? It's, this, this is like this is like um, like all of us have said. Oh God, I want to just I want to live the life of faith. I want to I want to break into new realms. I want to I want to believe you when nobody else believes. I I, I look at this this life as I, I'm so glad I get to live in North America, where there's so much unbelief. What an amazing privilege it is. It is. It's, it's amazing that we actually, you know, a few years ago we were so much smaller in number, but it was just so fun to see God just defying nature and just turning things around and seeing cancer healed and people delivered. And we've been having a whole bunch of bipolar healed this last year. It's, it's been amazing. They just get healed being in the room, though. It's, it's like I think only two people I know of, of all the list of folks I've seen healed in the last 14 months from bipolar, only two were prayed for. For healing, the rest just got healed. They were, they were just in the line of fire, I guess. They were in the room when he showed up. So here's this 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 passion that you and I have, just to rise in faith, and God puts us in this atmosphere where sometimes our closest friends they don't want anything to do with it. You you made a choice. You said I'm going for God. 
And there was this passion. Some of you even had family members that turned against you and just spoke evil of you or just didn't want to be with you because you're one of them whacked ones. Thank you, Jesus. Whack me again. And the, that cost has been counted up over and over again. But this is, what, this is what I want you to see. Jesus laid it out. He says, how can you believe you who seek honor from man? Those who have that thing in their heart that every time they make a decision, what will so-and-so think? Have embraced a lifestyle that under, undermines their own quest for faith. That was a good point. Bill, that was... Uh, an exceptionally good point. Exceptionally good. Really ministered to me. Trying to, trying to keep myself encouraged here. It's in the Bible. How can you believe who receive honor from one another? Do not seek the honor that comes from only God. Let's move on. We're about to finish. It's the shortest I've ever done at one of these conferences. So just in your journals, make note because it will probably never happen again. Verse 45, Do not think I shall accuse you to the Father. There is only one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Verse 47, just look at it. If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? There's an amazing a parallel in Scripture about um, there's a strange passage out of Luke 16 that creates, it describes a level playing field, Old and New Testament. It's, it's strange, but Old and New Testament alike, according to Luke 16, there's this level playing field. They were both sides of the cross. People were actually required to live by faith, and that's what qualified them. It's a strange passage. But here he says, you say you believe in Moses if you really believed in his words. The point is, if you really embraced what you've already seen the scriptures to say, you would have believed my words when I began to speak. All I'm saying is, is like attracts like. And when people embrace a word, when people embrace letter, they consistently reject spirit. When people embrace letter, um, the Bible says the letter kills, the Spirit gives life. Do you know that, that, that the Lord is looking to manifest Christ through you in the same way that Mary carried Christ into this world? I mean, it really is true. It may sound like a strange concept, and it may almost sound blasphemous for some, but to see the Lord's intent is that embracing the letter, religious standards will almost always cause you to renounce and to defy the move of the Spirit of God. And so he's saying here, if you really believed in what you said you believed, you would have responded to what I said when I said it. In other words, every time God is about to do something new, the way to make sure that you stay in a place to respond to whatever God is saying is that you don't just embrace in concept what you already believe, but you embrace with your heart. Do you understand there's a difference? To embrace in concept is, I mean, you know, theories. We have enough theory to choke us to death. How about you guys over here? Uh, maybe they don't know. I have enough theories to choke us to death. You know what? He, honestly, he is looking for a people that will continually, continuously discover the authentic nature of the gospel. There's no understanding apart from experience. 
There's no one in this room that had a clue what being born again was about until you were born again. It was the experience that began to open your understanding to the concept. You could have quoted books. You could have quoted evangelists. You could have done all kinds of stuff before you were saved, but there was no understanding until you were born again. I believe with all my heart that the Lord is once again trying to create a generation of whom it could be said the Word has once again become flesh. Please don't take that offensively in, in contrast or superior to Jesus Christ, the Word of God made flesh. What I mean by this is, is that we become what we believe. The more theory I embrace that I do not require experience from myself, the more judgmental I will be of those around me who do not have my theory. The temptation to embrace a theological description of God our Father as a harsh Father is generally embraced by those who cannot display power. Those who tend to embrace our Heavenly Father, as a harsh, judgmental Father, it is generally embraced by those who cannot display the power of God. And the reason is there's this, there's this quest to manifest God in the heart of every believer. And if we can't manifest Him, we have to have a reason why. And it's much easier to believe sinful conditions of the world have shut God down than it is for us to do the fasting and praying in the private place to get the divine encounter where we can begin to display and manifest the power of God. Now, what's been done in this movement, this that every one of us are a part of, is that Lord, the Lord has touched us. I mean, He's touched me so deep, I, I'm clueless as to what He's doing. But I, I've never asked to understand. I... I have things happen in my life. I mean, we have disappointments. We have swings and misses like everybody else. I don't walk away saying, why, God? I don't remember honestly ever asking God once. When my dad died, what I believed was way out of season, about 15 years too soon, I, I didn't ask why because I don't need to know. All I need to know is what do I do next. That's all I need to know. It's the only thing I have a quest for. I just, I just, I, I can live with mystery. I don't need explanation. I don't because, I, because I'm not living from here. If I was living from here, I would do everything different. Is this making any sense to you at all? It's, not, it's, not, it's honestly not an issue. It's, I, it's like understanding. I like it. If he gives it to me, it's great. But all I really need is to know what do I do next. What's he saying now? How can I best represent him now? He is good, authentically good, and he's there for me to experience and if I build a case in my mind of all the things God has not answered, then I will create around my life an attitude that will breed judgment and offense at God. Do you remember? I said I was going to end. I've got Randy's disease of multiple endings. <laughs> Actually, this is all the same ending. It's just the latter part. Actually, I can't blame Randy. He just encourages me in my weakness. So. <laughs> do you remember when the Lord, when John the Baptist, this is Matthew 11, I just got to do it fast. Um, John the Baptist sends messengers to Jesus, say, are you the one? Remember that? Are you the one? Where's John? In prison. He already knew Jesus was the one. He was the one who saw him coming and said, behold the Lamb of God. So what's happened? Well, what was Jesus coming to do? set prisoners free. What was John? 
prisoner who wasn't going to get free. That's why Jesus ended his discourse. Go tell John what you've seen and heard. Didn't give him any exposition on Scripture. Didn't give him a list of biblical fulfillments that he had in coming as the Messiah. All he did was tell him the blind see, the lame walk, the poor have the gospel preached to him. And then he followed with a statement. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. I don't need to understand. I just need to know what to do next. If I, if I, see, many come for prayer. They say, I've been prayed for a hundred times. Oftentimes I'll say, oh, I'll pray for you if you'll pretend it's the first time. Uh, honestly, I mean that because it's too, it's too hard. I can't climb that mountain. What happens when we make a list of all that God hasn't done? We, it, we try to give the devil ground. What we do is we're actually trying to create a list that justifies, helps us to feel justified in our unbelief. The key to life is focusing on what Jesus has done, what God has done, and what he's doing. That's, that's got to be the end. We'll just stop right there. All right. The quest of everybody in this room, I really believe, is the quest for extraordinary faith. And that one phrase of the Lord Jesus that he asked in, I think it's in Luke 18, he says, when I return, am I going to find faith on the earth? That's a big deal to me. And so when I read phrases like this, how can you believe? when you seek the honor of man. I mean, let's be honest now. How, how many of you, this is something you struggle with. You start to make a decision that requires faith, and the first thing that comes to your mind is, what will so-and-so think? Does that plague anybody else in the room still? Got five of you that are honest. That's great. Well, I expect the five of you to have a great, great deliverance tonight. That's right. We're, gonna, we're just going to believe God. I want you to stand because we're going to pray together. Before we start praying for the sick, I want us just to pray for each other regarding the things that I've shared. I just, it's just a lot, I feel a lot better if we can pray about what I've talked about. All right? Everybody happy? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. That's like the only verse you really need about faith. I mean, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. These passages like what I just read to you tonight out of John 5, that talks about how can you believe if you receive, you search for the honor from man, not from God. Sometimes we have alliances that we don't realize are compromising alliances that actually undermine our devotion to a lifestyle of faith. And so I think it would be really great for you to grab a hand of the person next to you. And we're going to pray. Now some of you, honestly, you may be tempted to say, yeah, that's me, and it's not you. You've really become victorious overall in your life. It's not that we never struggle with the fear of man, but it's not a dominating factor. There's some of you that honestly, I, I, I know that for a fact, that it's just not a dominating factor. But there are others. You, you've come here because you have such genuine hunger, but you're torn. And one of the reasons you're torn is that you've still got this place in your heart that values the opinions of others sometimes at the expense of what God thinks about a matter. And you maybe didn't even know that, that it was that contrast until tonight, but you know it now. Does that make sense to you? If that's you, squeeze the hand of the person next to you. Say, that's me. And tonight, I am letting you know because I want this to be the end of that lifestyle. See, faith is not this sweat thing. It's not this striving for breakthrough. When, when I see people striving like this for breakthrough, I wait for them to get exhausted. Then they're finally at a place where they can believe. <laughs> it's, it's, 
It's kind of like when the guy is drowning, you know, when he's fighting this guy. Ah, wait till he goes under or loses his strength, then save him. <laughs> if you do him while he's fighting, he may kill you in the process. Are you with me here? All right. So this, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray, and I believe that the Lord has released a grace tonight. I, I can feel it. I, I hope that you can too. I feel like there's this grace tonight that is made available to every single person that it would be like to step from one world into another. It's almost like a conscious choice. If there were room, I would say, everybody take a step forward. But but, but don't worry about it. Front row, I guess you can. But um, Honestly, just it's, it's like you're saying, I'm stepping out of the lifestyle of the fear of man. And as much as I know how, I have opened myself to say, God, your opinion of me matters more than anything else. And I am now realigning everything in me that I can get a hold of, that I can put my hands on, that I can somehow address. Everything in me I am aligning with the heart that says, your favor is all I want. It's not a theory anymore, Father. It's your favor in this moment. It's what you think about what I've done that matters to me. And if the person next to you squeezed your hand, then what I want you to do is I want you to serve them. And if you all squeezed each other, then great. Just go at it and help each other out, all right? But I want you to, I want you to pray right now. Lord, let this be a night of break. Wouldn't this be amazing to have this many people that were actually in one evening honestly set free from the habit, doesn't mean we're never exposed to it again, but the habit of the fear of man. Would that be amazing? It's possible. So let's pray now. I want you to serve one another in prayer. Father, let this be the night that my brother my sister is released from the habit, the habit, the lifestyle of the fear of man. just pray for that person that they will hear the affirming word of the Father. Because once you've tasted of the authentic, you never want the counterfeit again. So just pray that, God, let them hear. Let my brother and my sister hear the pleasure of the Lord for their risk and their efforts in faith. Yeah, just pray that. Pray it out loud. Not just quietly in the heart. Pray it out loud. God, let that release of the voice of the Lord, the favor of the Lord for their efforts and faith be realized. Jesus. Yes, God. Yes, 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 God. Yes, God. All right, go ahead and drop hands. Drop hands. We're, we we need to. We kind of need to refine our focus here. I really feel like the Lord just spoke to me uh, something. Like there's there's a significant number of people in here that do not live with an awareness of the Father's favor. It's, it's not that if you, if you were to stop and think about it, you'd realize it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that you go with a realization of the Father's favor over your life. See, when you've tasted of the applause of heaven, the applause of man sounds pretty empty, pretty hollow. And it's, it's realization of superior reality enables us to never again commit ourselves to the inferior. 
how many of you, 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 you would actually say, that's, that's exactly identifies where I'm at. I, I do not live with an awareness of the Father's favor. It's not that if you weren't taking time with it, you, you wouldn't be able to come to that conclusion. But it's, look around you. Look at how many people. As far as I'm concerned, this would be the greatest miracle possible tonight is to have this group. Put your hands up again. This is a big deal to me. I, I wouldn't have thought it would be quite that many. All right? I want you to pray. Those of you that don't have your hands up, you're the most well-positioned to help these. But there are so many people with their hands up that there's no way I can get those of you that don't have your hand up to everyone. So what I'm going to ask is everybody in the room right now, just put a hand on the shoulder of somebody. Those of you that don't, do not have your hand up, find someone with their hand up. I don't care if you have to leave your row. Get out, find somebody, and pray. We need this. We need, a, listen to me, we need a spirit of revelation. We need a veil lifted. We need a veil torn for some to discover the favor of the Father on their life. Begin to pray for this right now. Call it into being. Call it into being. The favor of the Heavenly Father. Just call it into being. Call it into being. Prophesy it into their life. Literally prophesy it. The Father is well pleased with you. Pray that the veil over the eyes would be lifted.